In this video, we are interested in nonlinear functions. Many applications can be modeled by using nonlinear functions. The objective might be nonlinear, the constraints might contain nonlinear expressions, or both. We will confine ourselves to nonlinear functions of one variable, which is an important case. The following is a simple example of a nonlinear function of one variable, say z. Assuming one variable seems to be more restrictive than it actually is because we are interested in linear approximations. If we knew how to approximate linearly a nonlinear function of one variable, we would be able to provide a linear approximation of the sum of nonlinear functions, each of which depends on one single variable. Suppose that a function g of multiple variables z1, z2, and so on is defined to be the sum of functions f1 f2, and so on. If we can derive a linear approximation of f1, a linear approximation of f2, and so on, the sum of these approximations is linear 2 and defines a linear approximation of g. Just to have an example, we could think of the following case. This is a function of two variables, which can be seen as the sum of the following two functions. Sometimes small technical tricks help to bring a function into a desired form. Consider for example a function h that is defined to be the product of two variables, say x and y. Apparently this is a nonlinear function of two variables. If we wanted to have a linear approximation of h, would it help when we knew how to approximate a nonlinear function of one variable? The answer is yes, and this is how it works. Define two new variables, z1 and z2, like this. In a model, these two definitions would be two linear constraints to be added to the model. Consider then a new function, say g, to be defined as so. G is a nonlinear function. Actually, G is the sum of two nonlinear functions of one variable. Let's see what G evaluates to.
In summary, the function h, which depends on x and y, can be replaced by the function g, which depends on z1 and z2. Furthermore, we must add the two linear constraints that define z1 and z2. And then, in the next step, we can replace the function g with a linear approximation of g. Let's now turn to the linear approximation of a nonlinear function of one variable. Consider a nonlinear function, say f, that depends on one variable, say z. In the first step, we define a set of breakpoints that cover the domain of the function. We assume that the breakpoints are consecutively numbered in increasing order. The number of breakpoints as well as the position of the breakpoints is up to you. Once you'll understand how we approximate the function, you can try to compute the position of the breakpoints given the number of breakpoints so that the approximation is as good as possible. But this technical detail is not important for grasping the modeling idea. So let's simply assume that the breakpoints are given somehow. What we want to have is a linear approximation. A graphical illustration shows this best. We want to have a piecewise linear curve such that the endpoints of the linear segments lie at the breakpoints and on the graph of the function. Any value between the smallest and the largest breakpoint can now be reached by a so-called convex combination of the breakpoints. That means that we can associate with each breakpoint xi a weight lambda i. These weights are non-negative decision variables. The lambdas must be chosen such that the sum of the weights is 1. Any value z between the smallest and the largest breakpoint can now be expressed by choosing appropriate weights. The same technique can be applied to the function values that relate to the breakpoints. Let y be a new real value decision variable. After introducing the decision variables lambda and the constraints shown here, y can now be used to replace the nonlinear function f of z. Note that the expression that defines y is linear. So are the other constraints. As shown in a previous video on the substitution of variables, y can of course be eliminated from the model immediately. In general, this is not all. As the picture shows, the piecewise linear segments connect subsequent points on the graph. This must be enforced because otherwise, line segments between arbitrary breakpoints can occur 
which would lead to a poor approximation of the nonlinear function. The way to model this is by using new binary decision variables, delta 1, delta 2 and so on, up to delta k minus 1. One of these delta variables must have the value 1. All other delta variables must have the value 0. Formally, the following constraint guarantees that. This set of delta variables, by the way, is a special ordered set of type 1. At most one of them is non-zero, all other variables in the set are zero. Some commercial software packages make use of special ordered sets to enhance the performance of the solver. These delta variables are used to indicate which pair of lambda variables is allowed to have a positive value. All other lambdas must be zero. In detail, we add the following constraints. The set of lambda variables, by the way, is a special ordered set of type 2. At most two of them are non-zero and these two must be consecutive. Again, some commercial software packages make use of special ordered sets to enhance the performance of the solver. This completes the linear approximation of a nonlinear function. It is interesting to note that under certain circumstances the use of the delta variables can be omitted. This is in particular true if the nonlinear function to be approximated defines the objective function. If that function is to be maximized and the slopes of the linear segments shown in the picture are monotonically decreasing from left to right, or if the function is to be minimized and the slopes of the linear segments are monotonically increasing, then the delta variables and the related constraints are not needed and the desired linear segments pop up automatically.